right, so I'm going to introduce Christy Lee. I think you guys have probably all met Christy. Maybe Ryan has not. I have not. And Michelle has not. Okay. Um, well, Christy moved to Tucson in May with her husband, and she has um, a PT. She's a PT, and her company is called It Is Well PT. And um, she's going to talk to us about injury, common running injuries, and injury prevention. So this is one of those topics that we can hear over and over and over, and it's all where there's always a new takeaway, I believe. And um, so hopefully you have a good takeaway from this talk um, and just something you can add to your toolbox. And over time, hopefully we'll have a pretty uh, large comprehensive toolbox and stay somewhat injury free. Um, so Christy, the first question I have for you, this is not related to injury prevention at all, but since you're new to Tucson, yes. what, was, what was your first real Tucson experience? Hmm. That's a good question. I feel like moving in the middle of a pandemic, it was pretty tough to even just experience much of anything, but I would say the extreme heat and then going up to lemon and being like, wow, this is amazing. Um, the temperature change. And I think just Tucson having something like that is so fun. Um, just, so you found you found Mount Lemon pretty quickly upon moving. Yeah, until it caught on fire. Yeah. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Bummer. It was like two yeah. weeks after we had moved. So that was pretty sad. So welcome to Tucson. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so could you talk to us about um, some of the more common injuries that running runners experience and why? Yeah. So as you guys probably know or experienced yourself, um, running is associated with uh, a higher risk for overuse injuries. <laughs> So a lot of the most common injuries are overuse, which is good and bad. Um, it's good because with proper training loads, with biomechanics and proper biomechanics, um, strength and mobility, these things are preventable. And so some of the more common ones, um, for females especially, it's typically you find injuries in the knee. So mm -hmm. patellofemoral pain syndrome is a really big one. And- so uh, different people. You, uh, oh. Put them all yeah. So patellofemoral pain syndrome is definitely a more global kind of broad term for just pain at around the kneecap. And so a lot of times this happens because of uh, improper training load, like I mentioned before, um, but also malalignment of that kneecap. So that can become an issue when you have muscular imbalances, when you have, you know, your tight IT band and then the, the medial side of your, your leg is weak, things like that. Um, and then mobility deficits as well. And then the other thing is, especially with like overpronation and things at your foot, those kind of things can happen for sure. Um, and then for women, you have to encounter the hormones. Um, and so taking that into to fact um, and their greater cue angle. So they naturally have wider hips and making that angle a little bit harder. So they have to work extra hard to strengthen their glutes, especially those side glutes as glute means um, to be able to prevent something like that from happening. Another one is Achilles tendinopathy. I know that I think probably three people right now in WOG I've heard overheard say that they have some kind of Achilles tendon mm -hmm. issue right now. And it is so common. Are you one of them? Oh, that's so funny. I didn't even know. Um, so this is actually more common in males. Um, males are more commonly injured at the ankle and the foot versus females knees. Um, so this one is oftentimes caused by malalignment of the foot, so overpronation or lack of flexibility from the beginning, but also it's that repetitive trauma over time. So if we don't strengthen it properly, especially after a previous Achilles injury. So can I ask you, have you, have you torn your Achilles or have you injured your Achilles prior to this moment? Uh, me, no, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a, it's a semi-chronic thing, like manageable, but chronic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what's sad about it is these are repetitive microtraumas, but the more that we injure it and don't fully rehab, 
then the weaker it just gets. And so it's easier to get these injuries over and over again. And so that's why rehab is so important for this, especially as soon as you start to feel that stiffness and tightness in it. Um, and so really just, I could give you some three steps. So phase one, isometric loading. So put some heavy weight on and just hold, just hold it up there for as long as you can. Phase two is more eccentric loading. So holding up the top and slow on the way down. Phase three is heavy, slow resistance. So that's like mid range. So you're not, you're not really going all the way down or all the way up where it might irritate it, but you're putting on some really heavy load and doing small ranges of motion. And then phase three, getting into those plyometrics, really explosive stuff. Cause that's what rent running is. Right. So, um, things like that are really important. And then, um, another one is medial tibial stress syndrome, AKA shin splints. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced that before, but yes. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty common one. Um, and this one is basically the, the muscles or the fascia. They don't know exactly the path of physiology of it, but that kind of pulling on the bone repetitively can cause the, the shin splints that you're, um, experiencing. And this has a lot of things that can come into factor here. Uh, training on hard surfaces with hard shoes because there's no real absorptive power there and um, that's just banging on that shin quite a bit. Um, decreased strength in those tibialis anterior muscles or those front shin muscles can cause that uh, biomechanical abnormalities of the foot. Um, and then also unequal leg length or if your hips are off, um, that can impact this. And then also the cold really impacts this a lot. They, they've done a lot of studies on that. And so warming up is so important. So, you know, like our Tuesday run yesterday, like making sure we warm up before that, that, uh, that run, because, um, it can get really cold here in Tucson. I found, um, it's not just from Ohio. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think those are probably the most common ones. Um, yeah, I yeah. Think, I'm sure we've all had at least one of those yeah. running experience. Um, has anyone had an injury that was not mentioned? Um, how many injuries do you want to hear about, Tia? <laughs> <laughs> Go through a lot of them. Well, pick your favorite. Well, I, I so Chrissy, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you for your time. I, I think what's important, and you mentioned a little bit is warming up, um, you know, so every runner kind of goes through their, you know, their injury phases. What are some important things that we could do, you know, just, just in general, regardless of your age or your fitness level to, to get ready to run or get ready to exercise, you know, what are three or four things that we should, everybody should do every time? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I always say that you should already have a like five minute strength routine, five minute mobility routine, you know, and typically that strength routine done before um, you work out and so, or right after, but right before, I think definitely making sure you do a nice slow, slow, slow jog and then getting in, in some calf raises. So to believe it or not, not even your gastroc, but it's your soleus. So it's another muscle in your calf is the powerhouse for when you run. It is the highest percentage of uh, energy creator when you're running. So if you're trying to, you know, go a long distance without trying to isolate that and strengthen that, um, right before you go and turn those muscles on, um, it can, it can impact you. So doing calf raises, super easy. Um, and then doing things like, uh, activating the glutes. So you can do running bowls or hip extensions, um, or especially with a band. So firing those glutes, cause a lot of times, runners don't fire their glutes. They're relying on their hamstrings and their low back. And that can not only impact your gait, um, it impacts your efficiency and um, running abilities. So um, thinking about if you're doing a running bowl, basically you're hinging forward a little bit and then you're scraping your uh, back leg on the ground, kicking it back and then drawing your hip forward. So you're working on exploding with those glutes versus your hamstrings because your leg is already bent and then pulling that hip flexor up. Um, so that's a good one to do right before. And then also your core. So if you do a quick, you know, um, 
panther walk where your knees are hovering off the ground and walking or um, a plank or something like that to just fire those the that core because you really want to be hinging forward and that takes a lot of core strength throughout um, your running. So yeah, those are those are some things that I would say for sure. Super quick things that you can add right before you go on a run. Nice. Great. Um, I have a quick question. So, yeah. um, you know, we, we talk about doing a lot of like, like activation exercises, but so why doesn't running itself activate these muscles? So it does, but if you're not, so if you have an improper biomechanical gait or run, you're not firing the right muscles because you're compensating in some type of way. So for example, with the glute exercise that I was just talking about, a lot of runners use their hamstrings and their low back, which does the same, it gets the job done, but less efficiently. So okay. if you can turn on and activate your glutes, um, especially your glute means too, because it running is a single leg sport. And so if your hips dropping every time you run, you know, not only can you have IT band issues and um, hip issues and low back issues, but you're more efficient when you can keep your hip and uh, stable and you can use that power to go forward instead of side to side. Okay, great. So does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. That's great. Okay. Um, another question I have for you, Christy, is um, so typically before a running injury happens, we get these subtle hints that we can still run through. And so we do. Um, so can you describe like, you know, just some of the little signals that our bodies give off right before they're about to shut down and what we should do about those? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, because I think runners, me being one of, <laughs> in that category, we're very stubborn, right? We want to run. So we're going to go out and run. We're going to push through it and it doesn't matter. So being attuned to your body. And I think the number one thing is listening to your body first and foremost. You know, if you stop listening to your body and just pushing through everything, you start losing the sense of picking up on those intrinsic factors. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the, the biggest thing too, is if you have a dull aching pain, if you have increased stiffness or feel a twinge, just stop and reevaluate that for a second. Um, some other things that you might experience is fatigue the rest of the day. You know, you go out and do your run and it was fine, but then you're just so fatigued because your body is working overtime to try to heal yourself. Um, some other things are pretty obvious, like slower times or harder work to do the same pace and same distance. Um, but then also longer time to recover. And this may have to do with your nutrition or your sleep or your stress or your overtraining. But if you find yourself, um, it takes longer to recover, to get back into a run, you know, taking a step back and asking yourself, you know, what are those things? Because if you're not getting proper nutrition or sleep or you're overstressed and you're trying to do too much, um, those things will eventually lead to an injury. Um, even if you don't have something going on currently, if you have all of these outside factors impacting your training, then, and, and you're not, if you're not, you're ignoring those, those things are going to come back to bite you. So I think that's really important. And, and do you always need to stop running? No. <laughs> um, a lot of people will say that if you go to a doctor, some physical therapists might say it, I hope not. Um, but you don't need to stop running. And that's the thing you want to do what you love. And so you just have to modify it. So I always say, you know, at first, if you start to feel a twinge or something happen, you know, you're like, I think I just strained something or whatever. Um, you can do a walk jog and then add in 10 to 15 minutes of strength training at the end. That's so important is, or, you know, maybe you can jog fine and it, it feels good, but just at the end, do 10 to 15 minutes of strength, you know, cut off that time. You, if you block an hour for running, do a 45 minute run instead and go a little bit slower. It's okay to go slow sometimes. And I think that's like really, really important to get through our heads is it's okay to go slow sometimes and listen to our body um, for that reason. And when you say strength, um, do you mean go into the weight room and no. lift weights? <laughs> you can, you can, you can absolutely do that. And if you have a gym membership, that's great. 
um, because you can utilize some of the things there. But especially now, there are so many ways to use household items or if if you just get a band, I feel like that's the number one thing, like just even having something to give you a little bit of resistance. A band is a great one for runners um, because you can do things like lateral walks or hip extensions or using um, bands for for posture reasons and things and core and all that kind of stuff. There's so many things you can do with it. So yeah, body weight goes a long way. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. Anyone else have a question? I have another one, but if anyone else has a question, you guys can go. Go ahead, Tia. Um, so I, you, you've kind of already answered this, but um, in a nutshell, like, what are the five recommendations for preventing injuries from happening, like overall? Yeah. Um, so like I said, when Tim mentioned the warm up, I think it's really important for somebody to have a strength routine and a mobility routine that they can go to. Um, mobility, think about your hips, your ankle dorsiflexion. So that's the flexion and an extension of, or pointing your toe and bringing it back and then toe extension. So many people have a lack of toe extension And because of that, their whole gait is off. They're not able to fire their glutes as much. So really even just doing a check, like take your toe right now, bend it up and see if it can go past. You need at least 65 degrees. So if it's not getting at least halfway up, you need to start working on that. Simple things um, that you can do for that, even like in a toe extension lunge and that back leg going into extension. And then for hips, even sitting, instead of doing a pigeon, you can do like a 90-90 so your leg is out like this and then your back leg is bent and back like this and working into those positions a little bit. I have more, um, I think I have actually on my Instagram, I have a mobility routine for your hips. So you can even look at that if you're you're questioning. And then strength stuff, like I I mentioned before. Um, I kind of think of mobility as like focused stretching. Is that true so no so mobility is think more of your joints flexibility is more of your muscles um so flexibility is important um it's i don't think in my personal opinion it's not as important as mobility but i think it is still important so you know for example in the achilles example if you have really really tight calves um, it's not going to matter how much mobility you have in that ankle your your tendon is going to stop you from using that mobility so being able to have both is really important but often where people get uh, stuck up because they're 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 stretching that's like a normal thing in society right now you know like you you stretch before you do something you stretch after you do something um but not a lot of people are spending time doing mobility so Combining those is, I think, a, a really valuable. So what's the difference between mobility and what, I guess, so you, you said the 90, the 90, 90, so that's not really a stretch. That's a mobility exercise. Yeah. So what you'll find is if you're sitting in that position, you'll feel it deeper. You'll feel it deeper in your hip, um, especially, you know, if you're sitting like this and you're trying to bring this foot up, you're working that hip mobility. And then if you're trying to bring that, my arm doesn't do that, but if you're bringing that back foot up, you're working that hip mobility versus, you know, if you lean forward over that front hip, you're going to feel a stretch in your glute. You're going to feel a stretch in your piriformis, that kind of thing. Um, so you're lengthening that muscle versus trying to move that, Mm -hmm. that hip in the socket. Cool. Yeah. Good to know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so working on strength, mobility, a little bit of flexibility. Anything, yeah. Any other real, like, yeah, I would stay injury free? Yeah, I think taking your recovery seriously. Um, I think a lot of us go out and run and then just forget that we ran and go on with our day. Um, so making sure we have proper nutrition, hydration, we're sleeping, sleeping is huge. And I think so many of us have, you know, succumbed to the Western culture of go, 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 go. We have to go. We have to go sleep when you're dead kind of mentality. And so sleep is really important. 
Um, and then taking active rest days. I don't think people take active rest days. So that's all under the recovery kind of mm -hmm. philosophy, like take it seriously and then assess your workload. Um, so take your easy days easy and your hard days hard, like stop living in the gray area. I think so many people live in that gray area and are too afraid to go easy. Um, and then when they go hard, they can't go hard because they've been living in this gray. So they're stuck. Um, so definitely taking your easy days easy and your hard days hard. And then don't do too much too fast. You know, know your body. And if you're having an off day, it's okay um, to slow down. So I think that's the last thing is just listen to your body versus your watch. Um, you know, I think a lot of us are like, oh, but I'm supposed to go, you know, eight minute miles today and I'm supposed to go six miles or, you know, whatever the workout is for that day, you know, instead of, Hey, like I can listen to my body if my body saying, I need to go a little bit slower today. That's okay. Or a little bit less mileage. That's okay. Or maybe you listen to your body and you're like, wow, I feel great, you know, and then go out and push yourself. So I think that's really big is, you know listening to our body versus what our, our watch tends to say. Hey, Christy, I have a question I heard you say, like, um, you said active recovery. Yeah. So, you know, I, many of us, you know, uh, are comfortable running three, maybe four days a week, but, you know, have a desire to be active for, you know, five or six days a week. Yeah. So active recovery, um, tell, explain what that means to you. And then what are some good, you know, maybe follow up with some cross training or some complimentary exercises, bike riding, swimming that you might yeah. recommend. So active recovery and then cross training. Absolutely. So um, active recovery is literally just moving your body and keeping your heart rate down while you're doing it. Um, I think that so, you know, so often when we're doing exercise, we think it has to be, you know, in, in order to count for exercise, I have to get my heart rate this high and I have to sweat and I have to, you know, all these different things. I'd be sore the next day. And you know, that, that kind of thing. And active recovery is just a way to move your body in a way that you can relieve stress and other things like that, um, without straining, um, too hard. So those things can be like yoga, Tai Chi, Pilates, and not going all out on those either. Cause it's, especially if you've never done those before, they can be really hard. So taking a beginner, you know, and, and doing that, going on walks, walking is so beneficial. And especially for runners, because I think so often, you know, we don't think about steady state cardio and slow cardio, um, as being beneficial, but it can be. And, um, so if you're going on a walk, that's great, especially out here, there's so many places that you can walk. Um, yeah. And so that kind of goes into the cross training and stuff too, you know, doing things like swimming and biking, like you mentioned are excellent because they're also building that cardio strength, but not being afraid to do something different, especially yoga and Pilates, they work your core and your glutes and um, oftentimes your arms more than um, other things. So when you com complement that with running, which is pure, you know, a lot of legs and yes, you have to have upper body strength and core strength. So being able to stress those kind of components and things like yoga and Pilates that can be really beneficial. Um, so I would say those would be definitely my top, um, cross training recommendations and active recovery recommendations. Nice. I think one thing too is having fun. Um, I think sometimes we don't think exercise can be fun. Um, so with your active recovery days, I think that's where you can find the freedom to find something you love. Um, I've recommended even for people to go out and dance, like just turn on music in your home and just like, just dance, you know, if that's really fun for you or, you know, doing something like playing a sport, like going out and just playing with your buds, um, just finding those things that are actually fun for you. And it might take some time because, you know, not, not many people know what that is. And so just experimenting and doing different things. Um, but any way that you can keep your body moving and have fun, it's, it's worth it. Good advice. I think one good thing about quarantine or COVID is that we have, it has sort of forced us to think more about just running for enjoyment yeah. and less about the watch. And, and so I do think that I observe more people listening to their bodies and just running by feel rather than time. So that's, that's a cool 
sort of byproduct of all of this mess right now. Um, you guys have any other? I'm, yeah, I'm I, curious. I, I, Go I, ahead, I, Ryan. I, Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think we've all experienced this where it's just like, sometimes we go out running, we just like, it's just a bad day. We just like, don't have it. Um, and I've talked to people about it. Like, what is the cause of that? Um, so that it's more predictable. And some people have said, oh, did you eat well? Did you sleep well? Um, but it seems almost a little more random like that. Just like, like in, in baseball, like a pitcher will just like not have like their best stuff, you know? And it, and so I just want to get your thoughts. Like when we just like go out running and it just, it seems like we've done the same thing we've always done. We just don't have it that day. Do, is it really sort of almost random or, or do you think that there are some things that we're doing that, that are preventable? Yeah. So I think there are times when it is just random. I think taking a step back, like I said, and um, evaluating, they were, they were onto something, you know, evaluating your nutrition, evaluating your sleep. But then, you know, if those things seem to be the same, you know, evaluating your stress level, you know, Hey, am I experiencing some stress that I've haven't dealt with? You know, am I hiding something? Am I pushing something down? Oftentimes that comes out physically. And so that can definitely be something, especially if you're not talking things out or dealing with things elsewhere that can definitely have an effect. Um, but sometimes it is just random. Sometimes our bodies, um, may have like, you know, some really, really great streaks of really awesome runs. And then one day it's like, you know, I'm just done and that's okay. And I think having some grace on yourself and not getting so hyper-focused of like, what did I do wrong? Like, is there something I could have done? You know, and that just spirals down and then you're probably going to have a string of bad days. Um, instead of just saying, Hey, this is a bad day. Like maybe it was, maybe it was nothing. Maybe it was just random. And then moving on, um, I think is really important. Okay, so in those cases where we, we would call it random, you're thinking that it's, it's like, it's not one of those major things, but it just could be like minor, like physiological fluctuations or just something that, that could just like today, you know, like whatever physiological, it's like things are depressed or, or, or not, or, you know, just things are a little bit off that that would affect a run. So it's almost like, like, it's not completely random. It's just, it's so detailed. We just can't really like, like capture what, what the minute changes are. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. Cause if you think about us as humans, we are very, very complex, right? Yeah. Like, and we can't just look at the physical and that's kind of what I was getting at too is, you know, if we look at our nutrition, if we look at our sleep, if we look at our, our recovery that we did the day before and our mobility and our strength and our, you know, workload and, you know, we have, and we fine tune all of it that's one component. You know, we have to look at our mental, we have to look at our emotional, we have to look at our spiritual beings and say like, Hey, is there anything in these other areas of our life that are impacting how our physical body is, is working? And then it comes down to, you know, the brain is crazy and it can do a lot of things, um, including, you know, a run, uh, impact a run. And then, and then it gets even more complex of, uh, you know, all of the things that can happen to our nervous system and maybe our sympathetic system is just really high that day. Um, I don't know if you've ever tested your HRV, um, but looking at components like that, um, if you have, most runners have some kind of, um, like, um, heart rate device. And so there's apps on your phone where you can track HRV and it's more of, you know, it's not necessarily about the number, but you know, how high or low, um, but that can kind of test parasympathetic versus sympathetic system. So if your sympathetic system is really high or it's just not balanced, um, then, and the variability is off um, and super low, that can impact your run as well. Ryan is like every type A runner I've ever known. We're all type A runners. Like what can I do specifically to make yeah. sure that that doesn't happen again? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah partially like, like I'm, I'm a statistician so i'm into like prediction okay. i'm like how can this yeah. not be predictable like it just seems like I, you're like you're like all of us in yeah, this, but, you, have, but, you have found your people man this yeah. is your yeah. place these type one, a people. one thing you can do ryan because <laughs> you said that about yourself i tell my type a runners this all the time if you really like the numbers and you kind of want to know do your heart rate check every morning Okay. And that, like you said, the heart rate, the heart rate is huge in letting you know, I, again, don't get carried away with the numbers, but if you wake up and your heart rate is high for whatever reason, you might not feel good 
or you you won't feel as good. You won't okay. have as good of a run that day. Um, and so take it easy. Just know, you know, it doesn't mean you're going to go have a crappy run. Yeah. But you know that you know what for whatever reason you need to maybe back off a little that day. And uh, okay. And have that, you that's heard, great to know because I've not looked at my heart rate pretty much yeah, at all. And in the morning, and not just up, heart rate. Morning. Yeah, and not just heart rate. Look up heart rate variability. Okay, yeah. yeah that's yeah. going to give you, as a statistician, oh, that's going to give you, you more information. Brian is in heaven. Brian's yeah. in heaven. Yeah. Right that's now. what he wanted. This is great. Oh, yeah, God. I'm going to look this up. <laughs> <laughs> Predictor variables. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. This is great. So um, it's heart, so heart rate variability, that'll tell you, like, that your is an indicator. Like if it's between this and this or. So it's heart rate variability is actually the difference. Um, so it'll tell you basically between parasympathetic and sympathetic system because your parasympathetic system, that's kind of the rest and digest. If you've ever taken any kind of science course, that's kind of the term is rest and digest. So that's your like, hey, I'm resting and digesting versus sympathetic is that fight or flight. Um, and so it's how variable it is. And actually the more variable it is, the ready, the more ready you are to train. Um, so you want that to be high and trending high. So, um, as a statistician, you're looking more for your own trends versus like, there's not a ton of research and honestly, everybody's very, so different that you have to look at your own. So it takes a lot of data points. Um, especially, you know, even if you're doing it over a couple of weeks to even get a base point and then seeing, you know, am I high or am I low today? Um, and yeah. basing how you're going to train based off that. That's why if you've ever seen the whoop, the whoop bands, you know what I'm talking about? No, no, no. Okay. Whoop. Um, it's basically a, a wrist thing and it, uh, it tracks your heart rate variability, but it also tracks your sleep and your training levels and everything like that to kind of predict and, and tell you, hey, you should train hard today, or hey, you should. Ask for that uh, Christmas. Yeah, but it, it's based off of heart rate variability and, and sleep, so. Oh, cool, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But don't get too caught up, like, you know, uh, you, you, it's great info. It really is, it's great, but, you know. Yeah, and, and that's the thing, like, as a statistician, it's not like, like, you don't go all in on the numbers. It's just like, they're just different tools. You know, you have experience, you know, you have your education, you have, you have statistics, you have all these things that just different pieces of information that you kind of pull together and try to get like the best, you know, piece of information that you can. But no, I, I, I get that. I, I, I won't, I won't go like, like down the rabbit hole of numbers and be obsessed with it. <laughs> but it, it won't feel so random, I think. Well, and that's what I'm kind of looking for is like, why is it, it just suddenly like you just, yeah, it seems yeah. random. Awesome. Um, any, any other questions for Christy? Um, I actually, I just have one more. This is, it, that is related to injuries. Um, you know, I heard that like, once you get injured, um, your probability of getting injured a second time increases. Um, and so I, I had like a really bad uh, shin splint basically that kept me out for like almost four months. And my question is, um, is this, this probability of like getting injured again, is that because like the injury, once you have the injury, you're more likely to get injured again? Or is it because there's something about like inherently me that caused the first injury that is more likely to get that second injury? Um, do you have any sense of that? Yeah, you're a smart man. Um, so I think both. <laughs> Um, so for example, the Achilles tendon, uh, we'll go back to that example. Um, so you're more likely to get injured again because the breakdown of the actual tissue, but if you strengthen and then you go to the root cause, if you're addressing the root cause and not just like, Hey, I'm just going to do calf raises until I, you know, die. That's, you're not going to, you're not going to see the benefit that you could or prevent the injury as well, if you address the malalignment of the foot or the, the weakness in your foot or weakness in your hips that affects your foot, um, all of those kind of things. So I think you're absolutely right. So the, the medial, medial tibial stress syndrome or the shin splints that, you're, um, that you have had before, if you address the root issue of that, then your likelihood of getting injured again 
pain is going to be less. Also, if you're a runner and a type A type personality, if you get injured in one spot and you keep trying to train and if you don't kind of rest it and address the problem, what will happen is that injury, I've had it where it goes like down one leg and up the other kind of thing where you biomechanically you're adjusting for the injury and you're injuring, you're going to come down with some other injury just due to your biomechanics and, and the way that you're compensating. Yeah, absolutely, Dave. That's so good. Yeah. So, so basically what, what I've heard of like in terms of running is like, you know, cause I, I think like, like when we're running, we often like, we'll get some sort of like muscle, something where you, you, you do feel some pain when you're running. And the guideline that I've always heard was if it doesn't alter your stride, you can kind of keep going. Um, do you agree with that? Or are there any other sort of guidelines of like, like, like when you start feeling like a little twinge of something, when, when is the point to, to stop? And when is the point to kind of keep going to see if it's, it's getting worse or if you can kind of make it go away? Yeah. So I think whoever told you that is, is correct too. And in some senses of the way, so if you're talking about a specific run, like not like long-term, so like I am on one run right now, when do I stop if I feel something like that? I think if it's altering your gait at all, um, you need to stop and reassess. Um, because like Dave was saying, it does, you compensate. And then you don't want to end up with five different issues versus just one. And that's not saying, hey, I have to stop and then I don't run for the next two weeks. That's, hey, I'm going to stop and assess what's going on, assess what might have happened, you know, why am I feeling this way? And then maybe even doing, hey, I'm going to stop. I'm going to go back to wherever I started or have someone pick me up, depending on how long of a run you really are on or walk back. And then, you know, spend some extra time doing some strength mobility stuff or reassessing, you know, hey, like, can someone watch my gait? Can someone check this to make sure that I'm, I'm okay um, before I move on to continue to run again? Um, so I think that's a really good measure. Um, for that. And, you know, like you said, is it getting worse? Because if it gets, if it's going to get worse, you know, in the, in 10 minutes, it's going to get even more worse in 60 minutes. Um, so just being able to listen to your body in that way, for sure. Fantastic. Great. Awesome. So good questions, guys. Yeah, that was a good conversation. Um, are we we good with questions? I think that's good. Christy, do you have any, any final words for us? Any any insights to make us better, faster, stronger? Keep being you, man. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. You guys are awesome. And even just working with you guys or and just training with you guys, you guys are definitely passionate people and you just love running. And I think that's the biggest thing, you know, just keep loving running. Um, and if you find that you don't, you know figure something out, take a break and come back to it because you want to keep running. Take a day off, Ryan, and come back the next day. It's just yeah. an aberration in your data points. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to say this has been great because I've, I've had like a serious injury where like I couldn't run at all. And it's just, it's so debilitating on so many different aspects of your life. So being able to try to get a handle on this and trying to find out ways to, to prevent mm -hmm. it is, is really important. So I, I really, uh, the, this, this session has been great. So I really appreciate oh, it. Awesome. Cool. That's right. Yeah, thanks you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you, Christy. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. See you guys. Bye, everybody. Yeah, Bye. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Bye.